don't see it anywhere. Where's Nadler? Which is my why did you come to this meeting tonight? Because this is very important. This is a major threat to the U.S. and to human autonomy on the planet. Explain to me why why it's a threat. Why what? Explain to me why it's a threat to us. Because it will no longer... I live in upstate New York where we've been fighting fracking, and a lot of towns have passed um, ordinances for a moratorium or abandoned fracking. If this TPP passes, those bans and moratoria will no longer be possible. They will be kicked out. People will no longer be able to determine what they want to have in their communities, how they want to live their lives. TPP will allow corporations to rule the planet. Okay, thanks so much for coming, everyone. Um, we're going to be throwing a lot of information at you, so I'm going to just get right into things here. Um, hi, my name is Adam. I work with a coalition of organizations called Trade Justice New York Metro. Um, we're an alliance of groups who've been working together, many of us, for over a decade to oppose trade agreements like TPP for many of the reasons uh, that you're going to hear about tonight. So we're just going to go right into the speakers right now. Um, we're going to have four panelists tonight. Uh, speaking to us first will be Elisa Simmons, who is the National Field Director at Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. So uh, without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Elisa. Thank you, Adam, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm just going to give my normal disclaimer in the beginning. It doesn't matter how many times I talk about the TPP, I get really upset about it. This is a real uh, affront to democracy and all of the issues that we care really, really deeply about. It's the most secret trade agreement that's ever been negotiated. The public doesn't have any access. Members of Congress, members of Congress who have constitutional authority to approve trade deals, members of Congress do not have access to the text. And we all know that members of the media are also locked out. However, there are over 600 corporate advisors who get to sit in, in negotiations and who are able to have input into what the text is. Right, so while we can't see anything, there are folks from Monsanto, Pfizer, Walmart, right? And all, all of those list of companies in um, uh, really shaping this agreement. Now, when I think about trade in a traditional sense, right, sometimes it, you know, it gets kind of boring to think about international trade. It's about tariffs, it's about exports and imports. But when I stop and think about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and look at the text that we've seen, because even though this is being negotiated in secret, there have been some leaked texts. And so we know that like what we're going to be talking about tonight, we know from the leaked texts. Okay? So when I look at that, what I see is a whole bunch of non-trade stuff specific to public services that corporations want to take over. Of the 29 chapters of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, only five are about not like traditional trade matters. And I'm actually going to show you the list um, as I get into the presentation so you can really have a sense of what we're talking about here. So, who's in the TPP? So right now, it's the United States, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam. And we know very recently that Japan has said that they want to join, and they will be involved in July, if not in July, definitely after that. So, getting back to the non-trade chapters and the trade chapters and the TPP. Of the 29 chapters, right, 
The non-trade chapters were talking about government procurement, investment, services, financial services, intellectual property, visas, temporary movement of natural persons. Isn't that immigration? Wow. So it sounds like it, right? What is this doing in a free trade agreement? Regulatory coherence, competition policy, labor, supply chains, the environment, transparency, which is a whole other issue that gets to generics and being able to afford medicines. And so these are all the public services, right, that corporations want control over. And so they use the free trade agreements as backdoor mechanisms to make sure they get these things approved. Who remembers the SOPA fight, Stop Online Piracy Act? So we fought that through Congress, and we won. <laughs> we won. What's showing up in the Trans-Pacific Partnership now is that it's they're trying to do they're trying to take SOPA and control the internet through the back door because they know they can't get it past Congress because we we already won. So all of the things that we fight for, right? All of the things that we fight so hard for to shape the way that we want to live in our communities. What our parks look like, what our environment is like, what kind of labor standards we want, you know, how we want to treat our neighbors, all of those things that we fight for in the traditional way. Corporations, when they figured out that they lose and they can't do that, they turn to these trade agreements to try to slide those regulations in and slide those policies in that door. So in addition to issues like internet freedom, there are provisions that would give greater property rights to foreign firms. Um, state laws would be um, subject to direct challenge in foreign tribunals. I'm going to spend some um, time about that, a little bit of time talking about the foreign tribunals. Um, there's going to be limits on financial um, service sector regulations. Uh, there's, there are even provisions there that would ban by American and by local procurement. <laughs> right? Crazy. Um, and then on top of that, most U.S. Uh, food that's imported doesn't meet standards already, right? About 1% of the food that comes in actually gets inspected. It's really scary, right? So we know that a lot of, a lot of things could be coming through that don't get inspected. We're getting food from countries that we know have really bad history when it comes to, to, um, import, when it comes to exporting their food. For example, Vietnam has one of the worst records in terms of food safety. And, but all of a sudden, we're going to get a whole bunch of um, shellfish in from Vietnam. And that food is going to be flooded into a system that is already under-regulated. On top of all the things that we know that aren't really about trade, there are three mystery chapters that they won't tell us anything about. They won't even tell us the titles of them. They won't list them anywhere. Last thing I'm going to talk about very quickly is the system that's called the Investor State Dispute Resolution. But this system is a system that takes corporations and rises them to the level of actual countries. Okay? So now a corporation can sue a government if that corporation thinks that somehow that government's domestic policies, whether it's federal, state, local, right? If somehow if those policies prohibit their expected future profits. Are you kidding me? No, <laughs> I'm not kidding. This already exists. This system exists um, under other free trade agreements. NAFTA, um, Peru FTA, for example. And I know my colleagues are going to give some examples, especially on the environmental front of the dangers of the investor state system and what's happened um, so far. I've got to wrap up. When I say that corporations sue governments, I'm saying that corporations, when they don't like our laws, they take our tax dollars to fund their profit because they don't want to abide by our laws. Colleagues will give examples, but just so you know, so far, there have been over $3.5 billion worth of taxpayer money, not from the United States alone, but around the country, I mean around the world, given to corporations who don't want to obey health laws and environmental laws primarily. So I uh, hope that's uh, kind of a, it's a brief uh, overview of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but I hope you found it helpful, and I'm happy to stay and answer any questions you may have.
Okay. My name is Ken Paris. I'm from the Communications Workers of America. I want to thank uh, Stephanie and Laura for inviting me. And they said talk about something. So, if you're on the street and you do a poll or you read polls out there, what's the number one issue that people are going to say faces the United States today? What is it? Jobs. Jobs. That's it. That's what they asked me to talk about. So, the big bar there is the United States. And our main minimum wage is $58 a day. A daily, our minimum wage for a full day's work is $58 if you're lucky enough to earn the minimum wage and you have a full-time job, right? All right. All right, eight hour a day, you get your minimum wage, $58. Malaysia, which is in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is $8.70 a day. China, which is not in the TPP, they earn a legal minimum of $4.59 a day. Now Vietnam is like one of the most important countries in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They are a key player here. And they are the low wage alternative to China. In Vietnam, the minimum wage is, for a day, is 223. That's not 223 an hour. It's not 223 until your lunch break. It's 223 a day. And that's the most important, one of the most important countries in this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Why? Why is it so low? Because in Vietnam, workers have no labor rights. Uh, workers, in terms of the right to form independent unions, forget it. Who's that a finding of? CWA? No, it's a finding of that radical group, the US State Department. They have restrictions on strikes. So Vietnam's labor code allows party, Communist Party controlled unions to strike, but imposes strict and cumbersome conditions that must first be met, which effectively nullify this right. So even if you're in a state union, a workers union that is tied to the uh, Communist Party there, forget about it. Strikes, forget about it. They're not legal. Who was that by? Human Rights Watch. Goods are produced by child labor and forced labor, especially in the apparel export industry, which is the largest export sector in Vietnam, and is the second largest exporter to the United States after China. They use forced labor, they use child labor. If you are trying to uh, organize an independent union in Vietnam, you can expect to be jailed, go to re-education camps, be harassed, and your life is really miserable. It's one of the worst places in the world to try and organize independent unions. Worse than China. <clears throat> Japan is now going to enter the TPP negotiations. And there you have a, an example of a highly industrialized country as opposed to Vietnam. So Vietnam will be used to export jobs to and reduce our wages. And Japan is going to have an impact also. Our trade deficit from 2009 to 2012 with Japan increased. And that meant a loss of 130,000 US jobs. When the TPP goes into effect, a study was done that uh, looked at what the impact of reduced tariffs were and what currency manipulation will do because Japan is manipulating its currency in the last eight months the value of the Japanese yen has uh, decreased by 30%. So that means goods that we export to Japan are 30% more expensive when expressed in yen, and goods that they export to the United States are 30% cheaper. So that impact will be 91,500, just in the auto and auto parts industry alone. So there's a direct uh, influence and effect of the TPP on jobs in the United States. And so what's going on here? 
Well, this is part of a overall corporate strategy. Not every small business and business are involved in this, but your big players are involved in this. So this shows what corporations and their political allies did, what they said what happened, and what happened. So the overall corporate plan, it's called the neoliberal model around the world. In the United States, it doesn't have a name. We don't even name it because people don't see it, and the media doesn't see it as an overall agenda, an overall plan, where everywhere else in the world, it's a neoliberal model. This is the plan. They talk about it in the streets. Here, I don't know what's going on, but here's what's going on. Corporations, the big fat cats, are attacking the two institutions that have any possibility of counterbalancing their power. That's unions and it's government. So the attack on unions is to reduce the number of unions, reduce the cost of labor, increase productivity, and globalize. The attack on government, taxes, decrease taxes on the wealthy and corporations, decrease social spending, deregulate environment, deregulate trade, deregulate labor, and deregulate politics. That's Citizens United and all that kind of stuff. And privatize and cut government jobs. That's the plan. And they say if you do that, our profits will increase, investment will increase, jobs will increase, wages will increase, our quality of life will increase, we'll have a trade surplus, and we'll go hand in hand into the sunset. Well, what really happened? We have an economic crisis, we have an environmental crisis, and we have a political crisis, all stemming from the corporate power grab. So in terms of, just quickly, here's a decline in union representation. This isn't just an accident, it's not inevitable but it's the result of corporate attacks and globalization. We produce more, but we're paid less. The top line is if weekly wages were tied to increases in productivity, as it had been from the end of World War II to the mid-70s. From the 70s on, you can see that bottom line, wages stagnated. The difference between the wage that we earn now and the wage that we would have earned if wages increased with productivity is more than $500 a week. That's 25,000 more on average per worker. Well, where is that money going? Uh, but I guess profits. Corporate agenda in terms of trade, we see a decline that the bottom part is trade deficits. That happened at the same time unions went into the nose drive. It happened at the same time when the productivity wage gap increased. It's a power issue. We see that we went into being a surplus trade into a country with major deficits, especially following NAFTA. Where are the jobs? Change in U.S. multinational corporation jobs, 99 to 2010. These big multinationals reduced their employment in the U.S. by 1 million and increased their employment in their controlled foreign affiliates by 3 million. Job loss due to NAFTA, 700,000 jobs lost to NAFTA, though we were promised more jobs. Entering uh, China into the WTO cost us 2.7 million jobs. Those are net. The TPP will exacerbate our economic crisis, our democracy crisis, the economic crisis we went through, democracy crisis. You heard about investor state. That will undermine everything we've worked for in labor, in environment, in health, in safety, in our effectiveness of our democracy because the corporations can get around what they couldn't get here, and they're getting a lot, what they couldn't get here, they'll end around. So, we're not alone. People are opposing this all over the world. And in your little packets, little postcards, please fill them out. You'll have, hopefully, one to your member of the house, two to your senators. Go in with a stack of these things and say, we don't speak just for ourselves or our organizations we speak for a lot of your constituents. So please fill that out, those out, hand them to me, and are you doing all right? No, we don't want you to do all right. We want you to be pissed off so that afterwards you're gonna make some noise. Because unless we make noise, we're gonna secret this thing through and pass it, and we're gonna suffer, our children are gonna suffer, the environment's gonna suffer, the globe's gonna suffer, everyone will be in the tank. Thank you. I'm going to start 
with this slide, which goes back to an issue that at least raised the beginning, and it's the 600 corporate advisors that have much more access to the texts and the negotiations than any of us uh, members of Congress or the media has. This list actually is public, the list of about, again, 600 clear advisors. They're all corporate advisors. There are about 20 or so non-corporate advisors, but we're clearly outnumbered. And this is a screenshot of the energy advisors to the US trade representative. That's the body of the US government that negotiates agreements like the TPP. So somehow missing on this list of energy advisors is the Sierra Club or Public Citizen. So instead we have, I tried to highlight, National Coal Council, Pants Natural Gas, Halliburton, Chevron, GE, the list goes on, Caterpillar, Nuclear Energy Institute, etc. So these are the institutions that are actively shaping the energy implications of the TPP. And I think it's really important to keep this list of actors in mind. Because once we understand who is actively involved in shaping this agreement, then it becomes a lot more clear why the agreement actually uh, looks the way it does and will serve who it will serve, which hint is most of these companies. So on the investment chapter, this is one of the 29 chapters that Elisa mentioned. And the idea, just like the idea of a free trade agreement is supposedly to free up and expand as much trade as possible to maximize profits, the idea of the investment chapters that have been included in all of our free trade agreements um, and also the idea of these bilateral investment treaties is to encourage as much investment, as much foreign investment, corporations, investors investing overseas as possible. And while certainly the idea of investment can be and is important, I think the rules in these agreements go way too far in offering extremely broad rights to foreign corporations to challenge environment, public health, and other policies as I'll talk about. So this chapter actually has leaked, it leaked about a year ago, so we know what's in it. And we know, for example, that the TPP will offer foreign corporations, for example, a guarantee to a minimum standard of treatment and fair and equitable treatment. These are extremely vaguely worded provisions that have been included in NAFTA and other free trade agreements that have functionally, essentially function as a standstill on regulation, because virtually any new law or policy, new regulations in the natural gas industry can be claimed to violate the predictable regulatory environment of an investor. Investors have claimed that, and time and time again, investors have won. And when a corporation alleges that their minimum standard of treatment or their fair and equitable treatment has been violated, they're then offered this investor state dispute settlement system, which allows the corporation to sue the government in a private tribunal for unlimited cash compensation. And because this really is too crazy to believe, I just took another screenshot. I have one more even after this. I'm a fan of screenshots. Uh, this is Lone Pine Inc. Resources. It's uh, US, conveniently located in Delaware. It doesn't actually have operations in the United States. Um, investor that had invested in Canada. So I just want to tell a quick story to highlight some of the threats posed by these rules. And this story brings us to Canada and actually to Quebec, where communities there had been fighting against fracking and fighting against fracking, particularly in the area of their St. Lawrence River. So after a long struggle with community engagement, the National Assembly of Quebec placed a moratorium on fracking, simply a timeout for fracking. <laughs> uh, Lone Pine didn't like that timeout. So what they did was they used NAFTA, this case was just filed at the end of last year, to threaten to sue Canada for $250 million under NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, because Quebec had violated their right to mine. I kid you not. So this is their notice of intent. Lone Pine is suing under NAFTA for the arbitrary, capricious, illegal revocation of the enterprise's valuable right to mine for oil and gas underneath the St. Lawrence River by the government of Quebec without due process, et cetera. I never heard of the concept of the right to mine until I got into trade work, and this is the type of threats that we can see being expanded by the TPP. Just to show this is a part of a campaign that the Sierra Club has launched with allies in Canada, the Council of Canadians, among others, saying there is no right to frack. We've been calling on Lone Pine to drop its case, but really using this just as an example of the types of cases that are being launched. With time, I can talk about you know, dozens of other cases um, 
A Swedish firm is suing Germany for Germany's commitment to phase out nuclear power in place of clean energy. And they already sued Canada or Germany for new regulations in their coal fire power plants, etc. There have been, uh, to date, about 500 cases launched against 95 governments. They're not hypothetical. I highlighted an environment case, but you can replace environment for public health, labor, or other public interest regulations. So I wanted to shift in my last few minutes to another set of issues that the Sierra Club's really deeply concerned about, and that is the ability of the TPP as I mentioned, to dramatically expand exports of natural gas, once again paving the way to more fracking across the United States. So, a little bit of background on this, as many of you might well be aware, because of new gas development, because of fracking across the United States, the price of natural gas in the United States is at a record low, as this map shows, about $3, 330 per BTU is the, is the unit of measurement. Whereas in other parts of the world where there's much less supply, the price is naturally much higher. So Japan, again, the newest uh, participant into the TPP is about six times higher. The price of natural gas in Europe is about three times higher. So naturally, the natural gas industry, think about that first slide once again, is really interested in exporting U.S. natural gas and fracking the gas in the United States, but then exporting it to foreign markets where they can earn significantly more money. So this, just to give you a sense, is a map of the proposed export terminals that the natural gas industry are proposing now to our Department of Energy to build terminals across the United States where they, again, can take the fracked gas and, and sell it to foreign markets. The Sierra Club is, of course, deeply concerned about these exports and has been intervening and opposing, actually, all of these export terminals for a number of reasons. One, again, is that it would dramatically expand fracking across the United States. If all of these 25 terminals were built, all most likely won't be built, but if all were, the U.S. could be exporting about 45% of our natural gas production. To sell all that gas, we have to produce more. About 63% of that volume would be from new production, and almost all of that would be from fracking. So it would put a tremendous strain to frack more gas. It would also require a huge new network of pipelines, which has tremendous climate implications of methane leaks, etc. And the greenhouse gas implications of just having to first extract the gas, cool the gas, liquefy the gas, transport the gas, regasify the gas has a life cycle larger than coal many say. Uh, it would also have a tremendous impact on raising domestic gas prices because there would be less supply in the United States and lock us into more fossil fuel investment at a time where we need to be transitioning to truly clean and renewable sources of energy. So what has this got to do with the TPP? Normally, in order to export natural gas, the Department of Energy is charged with doing what's called a public interest determination. And that's a process where it has to weigh the economic and environmental impacts of natural gas exports. And that process is really critical to being able to think through this process and to being able to build a deliberate energy policy. We don't think the Department of Energy is doing a great job of that. They've already approved the first export terminal. But nonetheless, having that process is a really important and it provides a really important advocacy hook for us. So consistent, though, with the free trade model, which is a deregulation model, U.S. law actually states that this whole process of a public interest determination, just an analysis to look at the impacts of natural gas exports, is waived for any country with which the United States has signed a free trade agreement that calls for something called national treatment for trade in gas, which we understand the TPP includes. And in this case, exports are automatically deemed in the public interest, and it becomes illegal to condition, deny, um, or um, delay any permit requirements. This is incredibly important in the TPP context because again, Japan is the largest natural gas importer in the world, may soon be starting to join the negotiations. And that can pull an enormous strain for more exports. They've already said one of the reasons they want to join is to, to import US natural gas, which could put a tremendous strain again to produce more and to, to frack more. So this is just one of the sort of many uh, issues that the Sierra Club is really deeply concerned about. And in this case, again, just the, the negligence that the United States, without even really having studied the environmental impacts of natural gas exports, would be signing away our right forever to be able to even review what some of these impacts are. So what do we do? 
Fight back. <laughs> so we should have said that from the beginning that all of us are telling some pretty dire tales, but there is a history of actually succeeding and stopping free trade agreements like the TPP. In fact, there's never been an agreement as big as the TPP that has gone through. There's a free trade area of the Americas, for example, which some of you may have heard of. Some of you may not have heard of because it never actually got to its point of completion in part because of citizen advocacy, like the one we are all engaging in together um, tonight. So we are, of course, going to be laying out some of the impacts of the TPP now, and then we're going to be breaking into breakout groups. Um, but I just do want to say that the best point to influence or to stop a free trade negotiation, a trade negotiation, is right now. It's in the process of negotiation. Once it reaches the floor of Congress, it is a lot more difficult. So just look forward to working with you all and figuring out how we can all engage together, reach our members of Congress, and let them know that there's no way that we would accept a deal and that looks anything like this. I'm very concerned about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We defeated in 2005 the Free Trade Area of the Americas, and now the TPP signifies a division going all along Latin America. As you can see, the countries in blue are part of what is called the Alianza del Pacifico, the Pacific Alliance, which are the countries that are also participating in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Well, Colombia and some Central Americas, American countries are not in the TPP yet, but most probably they will be. Some Central American countries like Costa Rica have already asked to be part of it. In green, we see the countries that form the Mercosur, which is an alternative trade agreement among the southern countries of South America. And in red, the countries of the ALBA, which are the most antagonistic countries to the United States, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. But what the TPP is doing is forming this alliance of countries in the, in the Pacific that are more uh, docile to the uh, dictates and the, and the hegemonic expansion of the United States uh, across the world. So what we're seeing is a big division in Latin America which is breaking the integrationist uh, aspirations that we Latin Americans have. I want to give some examples of investor state disputes already going on in Latin America or of which Latin American countries are being subjected to. And but you can see this cover in which we see two photographs. The one on the left is the house in the Hamptons of a guy called Ira Rennert who owns a company called Doe Run. Ira Rennert is one of the I don't know exactly the number, but he is worth like $8 billion. He's under, under the Forbes list. And he owns the most expensive house in the United States, according to reports. So that's an aerial view of his chateau, like a real uh, European castle. And on my left, you can see the town of La Roya in Peru, which is the most polluted uh, site, one of the 10 most polluted sites in the world, according to the World Health Organization. Uh, because there's a smelter that has polluted 200, 200 children are suffering very bad illnesses because of the lead in their lungs. But this guy, Iron Earth, well, the, the case is that Peru, the government of Peru decided to close the smelter because the owner, Don Ron, failed to clean up the smelter as he said he would. And many times he had many chances and he failed. So in the end, the government of Peru decided to shut down that smelter However, however, this guy, Ira Renard, and his company, Doron, that, that has uh, sued the government of Peru for $800 million. And that is at an at a international tribunal here in New York called the UNCITRO. So Peru is being subjected to $800 million because of the responsible action of closing down a highly polluting smelter. So this is one of the most egregious cases in which we, public citizen and Sierra Club and others are working on. And, but it's not the only one. I just came back from El Salvador uh, a few days ago. I still have a 
a little, well, not jet lag because it's St. Mary, but a little tired. We went on a mission to see different sites where Canadian and US companies want to mine. Um, and because of the resistance of the people and the struggle, the Salvadoran government has prohibited gold mining in the country because of the highly polluting effects that it has. You know, they have to use cyanide, and the cyanide has polluted already the water of El Salvador. And they have little of water left, and the people is struggling to have their last remnants of water clean. El Salvador decided to prohibit gold mining, but now is being subjected to 315 million US dollars by two companies, one Canadian and another one commerce group from the United States. Sorry, 415 uh, between both of them. So what we're seeing is uh, struggles everywhere. You know, that is the people trying to fight mining. Those that photo on the on the bottom is is called Los Niños del Plomo. It's a documentary of the lead children, how the lead children in Peru, the case I just mentioned. But there are even bigger cases like Chevron against Ecuador and Philip Morris is suing countries all over. For example, Uruguay decided that the, the labeling of packages had to be improved so people had better information about the, 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 the impacts of tobacco in the health. So Philip Morris is suing Uruguay. And you know what a company like Philip Morris can do? Because there is no bilateral investment treaty between the United States and Uruguay. But what can Philip Morris can do is use any bilateral investment treaty in the world with another country because they have offices everywhere. So they're suing Uruguay under the bilateral investment treaty between Switzerland and Uruguay. And the same goes on with, with Australia. This is why Australia, and I'm gonna conclude with this, this is why Australia is the one country that is against including investor state in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. With, with, among other reasons, but this one is very, very important because Philip Morris sued already Australia under a bilateral investment treaty between Hong Kong and Australia because of the same reason, because of health concerns. So every realm of public life everywhere around the world is being threatened not only by the TPP, but by other free trade agreements. We have here in the United States another monstrous free trade agreement looming, which is the European Union and the United States free trade agreement, which negotiations will start soon, June or July. And last, I just want to mention that NAFTA is going to be 20 years on the 1st of January of 2014. As the Zapatistas who rose 20 years ago, we must say again, ya basta. And ya basta de TPP y basta de free for agreements. Gracias. So the first question we have here is, how are congressional representatives barred from knowing the text of the TPP? Isn't this illegal? The short answer is, Unfortunately, it's not illegal. The system in which our trade agreements are conducted and negotiated is, is very different from the system in which other laws and policies are negotiated. Um, so there, for example, Senator Wyden, a senator from Oregon, he is the chair of the Senate Committee on Finance, which is the committee with jurisdiction over trade, was actually denied access to the text, even though that is his primary jurisdiction. He had to introduce a piece of legislation called Congressional Oversight Over Trade Negotiations Act, just in order to get access uh, himself to the trade negotiations. So um, that's the short answer, but, but it in fact is legal to conduct these negotiations under uh, such incredible secrecy. Three and a half years into the set of negotiations, governments want to conclude it by October, and not a word of draft text has been released. Uh, next question is, what strategies are being used to involve colleges and universities in the campaign against TPP? I can take that one. 
Um, at Public Citizen, we travel around the country, um, and we really do try to focus in on colleges and universities um, while folks are there and uh, you know able to do things other than studies. To be honest, it's been a real challenge um, because of the flow of students, student life, and kind of where they are. So we're trying to hit people in their communities wherever they are. So you know whether it's college or whether they're back home, um, we follow people stay up with them. Okay, uh, next question is specifically directed at Bangla. Uh, why would a country like Peru, with an $800 million uh, suit uh, for shutting a smelter, be interested in TTP? Was it strong armed? Is this the old transnational elites in. And this is why oral questions have an advantage over questions on cards. Um, in something. I think it could probably get the gist of it. Well, I think the question has the answer. <laughs> yeah, it is the elites of Peru, the elites of Mexico, the elites of uh, Costa Rica, the elites of every country that are benefited by these agreements because they uh, internationalize their businesses. No? They, they, they are part of the, an international circuit of capital. Uh, it is not nations against nations that compete in free trade agreements. It is free trade agreements are about giving uh, corporations from all over uh, you know, these enhanced rights. And so we have in Mexico, a, for example, in my country, Mexico, a huge elite. Uh, you have the richest man in the world, Carlos Slim, and a handful of corporations that are getting richer and richer with NAFTA, and so on with Peru. So yes, that's, that's the answer. Previously, trade agreements were about tariffs, you know, the charges on goods imported and exported. But that's changed because the structure of the corporation has changed. Now corporations, the big ones, are globally integrated enterprises that have supply chains that cover many different countries and value chains that cover many different countries in terms of the distribution and their markets. So what they're looking for in these agreements is they are economic integration agreements for corporations in terms of their making the world safe for their supply chains, which is what this investor state is all about, and the attack on protections that particular countries have to protect their workers, their environment, health safety, <coughs> things like that, and for their value chains. So these extend, as you mentioned, to all these different countries that want to be part of this value chain that is controlled by these mega corporations. They're not multinational anymore. They're not like they used to be. This is a transformation in the evolution of the corporation itself. Okay, next question is, why would governments want to participate in an agreement that would undermine their own sovereignty? Okay. Well, I think it's related to the last question, no? I mean, what? Uh, we've said response a little bit to this, but also I want to say that there's a lot of corruption in this in this process. Uh, a lot of corruption. Uh, there are, you know, the, there's a very important document released by the Transnational Institute of Amsterdam that's, that that uh, relates how a very tiny, the dark bunch of uh, lawyers control this industry. No, this industry of, of uh, defending countries and defending corporations behind doors. And there's a lot of money around this industry. So there's a lot of corruption as well between governments and lawyers and uh, all these back deals that we don't know about. But uh, we have to do more research, analyze more how this whole thing is operating. I would just add one other thing, which is maybe to point out the obvious, but there's a huge power inequity between the countries in the TPP. So you have the United States, which is the country that's advancing these investment rules, and you have a country like Peru or Vietnam that they just don't have the same negotiating power as the United States has, and yet there's this dominant ideology out there that you cannot develop and you can't attract investment unless you sign on to these type of agreements. So countries are left with very little negotiating power, even if secretly, or we're here in private conversations, there's actually a lot of concern. There is the impression that there is no alternative, 
Margaret Thatcher, that these are, these are the rules that will sort of unlock development, even though evidence shows that it's actually the opposite that is true. And just to say on the investment rules in particular, again, the dominant ideology, what the United States says to other countries is you need to sign these agreements and these investment chapters to get access to investment where we can show you a list of studies that actually show there's very little, no correlation between actual foreign direct investment and signing on to investor state dispute settlement and these investment chapters. It's actually things like infrastructure and electricity and educated workforces that are what drives investment, not these investor protections, but yet that's not the story that's being told and that's not the negotiating power that's in play. And I just want to add one thing um, to what Danielle said about the corruption. I neglected in my, in my earlier description of the investor state dispute re resolution system and the foreign tribunals. I neglected to say that it's set up by, you have three un unelected judges, right? And these judges are sometimes attorneys representing corporations, and sometimes they're judges deciding on <laughs> the cases in these foreign tribunals. And so it's set up to be unfair, to be completely unfair. They're, they don't abide by any rules. They have job security for, <laughs> for you know, ever and ever if they'd like it. And there are absolutely no appeals mm -hmm. to the decisions that they make. And so it, it just adds on and, and highlights the, the, the corruption that many all started to talk about. I just want to add one thing about the corruption. What I mean also is this thing called the revolving door between government officials and industry or, or business. Many times our, and I think it happens also in the United States and in Europe, but in Latin America, for example, many of the people that work in governments, once their government is over, they go and work in very, very high positions and in the boards of foreign companies or, or, or national or, or transnational companies. So this is what I mean by corruption also. There is this, that they are part of this ruling elite. The, 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 the main negotiators of these agreements are part of this elite. No, they're not different. They're not representing the international interests or anything. And just to add to what Lana said, uh, the best example, I think, of how these agreements are not necessary to attract foreign investment, I think, is Brazil. Brazil is a country that hasn't ratified, or it doesn't have in, in place one single bilateral investment treaty or free trade agreement, and is by far the country that has been attracting for several years more investment in Latin America. Compared to Mexico even, you can see the... There are, I would say, a good 25 questions here. The one question I do want to take, because it's, it's, it's a, a, a variety one, and the question is, it sounds naive, but uh, I think it's important. Is TPP uh, conceived as a platform for world government? <laughs> I'll just I'll do an end around here. And I think the issue isn't world government, it's corporate power. Yes. And the bottom line to all that we're talking about here is power. Now, a lot of people think of power as a zero-sum game. They've got it, we don't, we have to take it. Uh, and they, we have to get it from them. But it's not like that. Power is created, and it's up to us to create a movement, to create power, to fight this. And this is happening all over the world. We are part of that, you are part of it, and it depends on us to create power. Okay, I want to thank our speakers, and I want to ask everyone here to stay for the part where we discover how to use our power. We have the power to impact, influence our congressional uh, representatives. If we don't use it, they will do what the lobbyists tell them to do. So it's extremely important to find out how to lobby. And that's the next segment of this event. Please stay for that. Okay, anyone who's in Charlie Wrangell's district, go over there. Let's hear another sign. Steve Israel. Yeah. Steve Israel. If you're in Steve Israel's district, go right over there. Okay, next. In the front. Okay, Yvette Park. If you're in Yvette Park's district in Brooklyn, you're over there. Jerry Nadler. Jerry Nadler, right over there. West side of Manhattan, Brooklyn. Grace Meng in Central Queens. 
Elliot Angle in the Bronx and Westchester. Over there. Hakeem Jeffries. Back in the back. Hakeem Jeffries uh, in parts of Brooklyn. Um, is there another one? Okay, uh, who else has a sign? Oh, I do. Lydia Velasquez. Okay, in the back corner uh, is Carolyn Maloney. Where? Where? What's that? By the exit sign. Okay, it's Carolyn Maloney. Is there anyone who has not heard their representative call? Raise your hands. Okay, uh, okay, Joseph Crowley, meet over there. Joseph Crowley group by Joe. Joe, hold up your hands. Okay, and... Okay, if you're in Nita Lois District, uh, meet by Jim, who's right behind you. Right over there in the, in the jacket. Okay, anyone else not hear their district calls? One more over there. Jose Serrano, if you're in Jose Serrano's district in the South Bronx, you're over there. Okay, any others? Anyone else not here in the district call? Okay, great, I think we're good. Lydia Velasquez, that's me! Wherever I end up. What do you think is like the most important time related issue having to do with this uh, TPP? That's a really good question. I think specific to what's coming up immediately uh, is something called fast track. And it's, it gives the president the authority to negotiate trade agreements outside of Congress. So Congress has, con has constitutional control over improvement and negotiating uh, negotiations of trade agreements. Back in the 70s, Nixon figured out that he really wanted more power and needed more power in, in terms of how to do this. And so he created Fast Track. Every president has to request it from Congress. They don't just have it automatically. So they have to request this power from con Congress. And what we have to do right now, immediately, is make sure that, they, that, the, that President Obama does not get that authority to just negotiate negotiate away without Congress having oversight and a say in, in what's going on in the TPP. In response to the question of how the TPP would relate to fracking, um, the Sierra Club is deeply concerned that the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement would dramatically increase fracking across the United States. And that's for two reasons. The first is that the TPP would strip our Department of Energy of its ability to oversee, slow, or stop natural gas exports. The TPP would expand natural gas exports to countries in the agreement, and once we're shipping our gas to other countries, there would be demand to produce more gas and to frack more gas. That's the first reason. The second is that the TPP would empower foreign corporations to sue governments over laws and policies which reduce their future profits. And we've already seen uh, an example of this type of lawsuit under the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, where, for example, uh, a moratorium on fracking in Quebec was, was being challenged by a U.S. oil and gas firm claiming that the moratorium on fracking violates their right to mine and the right to frack underneath a river in Quebec, Canada. So we're really concerned that the TPP would pave the way to more cases like this that directly challenge government's ability to put in place policies um, that ban or place a moratorium on fracking. We're going to create a town hall and an educational uh, thing on TPP and invite the uh, three to four uh, representatives to show up and answer questions about TPP. And so if they don't show up, it's, it's a thorn, you know, it'll stick out like a sore thumb. But everybody who comes will learn uh, what TPP is. So um, that's it. Uh, I think there are a couple of local newspapers, small advertisement, the free circulars, uh, and then go through and meticulously identify the advertisers. 
that are advertising in those local papers and go to them and turn them. Spend a little time with each of the advertisers, make, make them your friend, explain the situation, explain how this, uh, the T -T TPP um, agreement would really hurt the people, and then use their names when you pitch the editors of those newspapers to publish the letter to the editor that we will write. And we're going to gather some materials here to, to make uh, that canvassing go smoothly, and so we have materials to leave behind to educate those advertisers. And then uh, in the letter to the editor, we are going to make a very simple request that each reader call and write each of the United States Senators and their House representative, demanding transparency in the trade nego in the TPP negotiation process and demanding no fast tracking as discussed previously. Thank you. See, so, yeah, um, I guess the first steps we're going to do is um, one of our members has a contact who works at a bookstore, so we're going to try to do a teaching at the bookstore so people can learn about the TPP and stress the fact in very human terms that this is this is basically a global corporate coup against you know people of the world and you know explain to them in very human terms that this is this is catastrophic. So that's basically it. There's some caution with regard to Yvette Clark. She uh, refused to sign the Grayson letter that's uh, saying that she would be opposed to any cuts in uh, Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. And uh, uh, she, uh, one of her uh, staff actually very honestly said, we're waiting to see uh, how our constituents feel about this. Uh, so she's a traditional politician. She's going to follow uh, the Democratic Party and the president, I think. Are, are we going to uh, work on organizing, uh, contacting uh, groups that we think are sympathetic uh, to uh, an anti-TPP position and organizing uh, a congressional visit as a start uh, to uh, Eva, Eva Clark, asking her to oppose um, fast track and to oppose and, and, and not and, and, and not letting her hide behind the fact that they don't know what's in in uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's leaked, it's, it's the MAI coming back, uh, probably with, on steroids itself. So we, we know what this, this, this is, it's a, as the person before said, it's a corporate coup, and, it, and uh, we're, we're not going to uh, let the congressman hide behind it. So Vivi Velasquez has, has, represented, um, has represented parts of Brooklyn and Lower East Side for the last 20 years or so. Um, but her district has changed considerably during that time. Um, she she's actually has a pretty good record on, on trade issues. She she opposed a proof free trade agreement, opposed opposed CAFTA. I believe she also opposed the last uh, last three. Yeah, she opposed the last three ones with uh, Colombia, South Korea, and uh, Panama as well. And she she opposed fast track back in 1998. Um, so she was, she's a pretty good, good ally for us. She also has a lot of, um, uh, consider a lot of union support among her, uh, among her donors. So she, what we would like, we, we're trying to push her to exert some more influence, especially among the, um, committees that she's an important member of, like she, like the Small Business Committee, the, uh, Financial Services Committee, and um, in caucuses like Hispanic Caucus, Fair Trade Caucus, and Human Rights Caucus. Uh, we're, first thing you want to get her position, we're, we are going to ask her her position on the TPP, on, uh, on Fast Track, and releasing the texts, and, um, and through both phone calls and in-person meetings, we want to ask her to exert her influence on other members in these really relevant committees um, to to also really oppose this and um, and be a strong supporter of releasing the text along with the other Congress members. So um, yeah, so hopefully this this should be you know pretty pretty good potential here um, with with many of Alaska's. Jay, now there is another Congress member who's been a strong ally. He's voted um, against all of these uh, NAFTA-style trade agreements. Um, 
in recent years. Uh, so we, he's someone we're trying to ask to continue to be an ally. Yeah, he has according to Adam's group an 86% scorecard, and the only ones that match him from downstate are um, Velasquez and Serrano. Um, and they were all members of the Progressive Caucus, but the caucus has not been, which is the largest caucus, has not been all that effective. There were 19 of us. Um, just over half of us were from his stronghold of uh, the Upper West Side, and then the, the other um, portion was split between um, um, further south, running from Clinton to the Battery on the West Side, and um, the Brooklyn portion, which is Borough Park and the surrounding. So at some point in time, we will be dealing with things um, on a sort of tripartite basis. But right now, our focus is obviously um, going to be on getting a meeting with him directly. Um, we're going to be, um, we've already shared all of our contact information, so we're going to have a, um, a doodle um, set up so that we can exchange ideas. But the kinds of things that we did discussed above and beyond um, meeting on this is tabling on the streets, um, approaching the various clubs, um, his, um, um, we already know, um, um, for access to street fairs. We're entering this, this season where street fairs are ubiquitous, particularly on the Upper West Side. You can't go a weekend without a street fair to, uh, to publicize this issue. Also to use um, social media to, to do that, um, um, Facebook and the like, um, to do um, a letter writing campaign um, to the newspaper of um, record, um, as well as to smaller um, neighborhood papers. So we're going to be collecting those media things from everybody in the, in the group. Um, an issue was raised in finding out via open secrets, which is something that everybody will want to do, of who are his major funders who he may potentially be beholden to. He has a significant war chest but it's never been used for anyone other than him, to my knowledge. Um, and obviously meeting again, and that we will be able to do um, once we have, um, and I'm sure knowing who has got it, um, um, a quick um, email and um, doodle thing um, coming up. So I guess that's basically Great. it. Excellent. Um, well, we haven't got very far yet. We've set up our next meeting. Um, apparently the strength in my group, which is very small, um, is these enormous mailing lists. Um, I have Claire on my list with uh, a mailing list of 5,000. And I have another um, lovely lady from uh, Riverside Church. So. We have these two huge assets, and Stephanie, again, who has wonderful mailing lists. So I think we're going to start probably with a, a letter, um, you know, craft a letter using these lists, since that's obviously huge. And then um, we're meeting in a, in, in a week and try and figure out
can reach out to democracy now. Um, Waloni. Uh, we have somebody who works with the uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, so we're just going to set up a meeting. Um, this lady here is going to try and get us onto the agenda at CUNY uh, for an interview and also with the Senior Center at City Corps, which sounds pretty promising, right, City Corps? Maloney? Sounds good. And uh, with the Great Panthers, you can say that. She's the Great Panther. Panther. And with Resistance Cinema has connections. Right, we didn't get to that. We have, here's what we have. We have so many ideas, we only could pick five. So Resistance Cinema, two of the people in the group we have connected. And finally, um, Gary, oh, Gary Null, yeah. I'm going to try and talk to Gary Null, see if he'll do the program. So that's so hard. Okay, excellent. So we have been graced by the Raging Grannies, and they're going to sing for us tonight, right now. <laughs> 